Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of A Little Bit of Genius, a podcast run by Nord Anglia students. My name is Alva. I'm a grade 10 student in Nord Anglia International School, Dublin. My name is Daniel. I'm also in grade 10 and I also go to Nord Anglia International School in Dublin. Today, we're happy to welcome Sir Tim Smith, the founder of the Eden Project, a global garden housed in tropical biomes that nestle in a crater the size of 30 football pitches. Welcome. Hi there. Hello. Hello. Before we go any further, how would you like us to refer to you? To be quite honest, I always feel as if I've been a naughty boy when people call me Sir Tim. It makes people think that I'm far too clever. Normally, what, what often happens, so that you, you feel polite, is uh, you say Sir Tim, and I then say, please call me Tim. <laughs> First of all, what inspired you to start the Eden Project? Cornwall is a, a very wild place that was economically down on its luck. And I had restored a famous garden called the Lost Gardens of Heligan. Yeah. And I started to dream about whether we could do something very, very big. And the more I dreamt about doing something very, very big, the more people said that we couldn't do it. And the more people tell me that I can't do something, the crosser and crosser I get. And I want yeah. to prove to them that we can. And I suspect the two of you are the same. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so had you always had interest in nature and the environment? We heard you were an archaeologist before you started working on this project. So were you always interested in the outdoors or was this something that was quite new to you? I was always interested in the outdoors. And as you say, I was an archaeologist, which is a bit like wanting to be Sherlock Holmes for past ages. Yeah. So it's really romantic. I love the outdoors but I wasn't uh, thinking that I'd be making my living outdoors. I thought I was just going to be having my hobbies outdoors because I guess I actually did completely the opposite because having been an archaeologist, I then for 10 years went into the music business, which was about as unhealthy a business as you can imagine on aeroplanes everywhere, working in incredibly unsociable hours. Um, and then one day I decided I wanted to have a complete change of life and I made a decision which a lot of people think I'm joking, but it's the absolute truth. I decided on one particular day that I was going to lead my life in a very different way. I was going to do whatever I felt like doing. I was going to trust my instincts. And you know, the weirdest thing is from the day that I decided to trust what I felt, the dice that I've rolled have rolled six. It is very funny when you actually do what really pleases you as opposed to what you think other people want you to do. Yeah. It is strange. Your whole body language is different. Your whole approach to life is different because you're just mm -hmm. taking responsibility for yourself and not trying to impress dad or mum or whatever. I think that's one of the things I wish I'd known when I was very young, not to waste a minute of my time trying to please my parents on the grounds that by the time I was as old as they were, I realised they didn't have a clue either. <laughs> yeah. Did you find that this made you uh, a lot happier throughout your life um, and made you approach things very differently? It made me, made me approach things very, very differently. It also made me understand the difference between qualification for something and being educated in something, which are completely different things. And I know at your school, you're very strong on the difference between qualifications and education. And an education, in my view, is is about nurturing the inquisitive and curious inside yourself and trying to make sense of all the things that link together as opposed to just being interested in one tiny thing. You actually see its relationships. You also discover something else, which is when you're brought up by people who tell you to worry about things, you must be cautious. Don't exceed yourself. How many times have you heard people saying, don't get above yourself? Yeah, a lot of yeah, exactly. Or what makes you think that someone like you can make magic happen? Yeah. yeah. Um, I would advise you, whenever you hear people like that, cross them off your Christmas card list <laughs> and have nothing to do with them. Yeah. Because actually, the real thing that most people don't know, I'm assuming that we're talking about a reasonable risk, not I'm yeah. going to walk a tightrope between two high buildings. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that in terms of reasonable risk, I'll explain this. The moment you have decided to take that risk, the moment, literally the instant of that decision, all the tension you felt in anticipating the risk goes. So you mm -hmm. can put all of that energy into the action as opposed to the fear of the action. And extraordinarily, you can only say this to people who are prepared to take risks. Suddenly, the risk is half the size that it was in your imagination. Yeah. 
And then yeah. the next stage is to learn how to tell a good story. The four most important words in the English language are once upon a time. <laughs> you know what? You've only got to use those four words and even people in their 80s start to listen. They can't help. They draw in. And then you need to tell them a story of something wonderful, which everybody working together can achieve. And people want it to be so. They do. They want it to be so. Strangely, people would prefer it if you dreamt bigger. You will not believe me, but it is easier to raise five million pounds than it is to raise five thousand pounds. Because your story for the five million will be, when we've raised five million pounds, this wonderful world will be there. These wonderful things will be there. And if you tell the story right, other people will believe it and they want to join you on the journey. Yeah. Persuasion kind of um, tactics. Exactly. So starting the project, was it hard for it to gain momentum or attention? Well, no. Um, <laughs> this, this goes back to storytelling. The media, the newspapers, television are very lazy. Mm. If you are a good writer and can tell a really good story, you can tempt them to come closer to you. So I told them that we were going to build the eighth wonder of the world in the crater of a mine in the wild, wild west. And they were already mine. You know, that's only one sentence, isn't it? Then you tell them about the greatest conservatories the biggest collection of plants useful to human beings. And it will be wondrous. And you know what they then they, they go, the but is they want to find that you're, you're a dreamer and that dreamers are people who can never deliver things. So what you must learn if you want to be a dreamer is to take on board, pretend I'm tattooing this on your forehead, but please don't. <laughs> <laughs> is this phrase, dare to dream, and organize to deliver. There is nothing more bewitching to older people with banks behind them than that you dare to dream and then you demonstrate that you know what you're talking about. I was told once uh, by the New York Times that I was a visionary and I challenged them. You know what I said? I said, is there anybody you know between the age of 10 and 14 who does not dream of building an Eden project? or a mad Ludwig castle, or a dam, or a super yeah. fast boat. That's what you do when you're between 10 and 14. Yeah. Don't you? You do that, don't you? So I'm yeah. not a visionary. Hooray! I'm not a visionary. <laughs> the only bit about me that was visionary, if you have to use that word, was that I dreamt that I could persuade as many as 300 people who had been professionally trained to only use the word no to say yes. That was all I had to do. And that's how the Eden Project was built. Wow. Wow. Do you think that having worked on the Lost uh, Gardens of Halligan, um, your experience from doing that really helped you to persuade people to believe you? Undoubtedly, because Halligan had been a success and the documentary about Halligan won the award for best documentary of the year for the BBC, people did believe me because they knew I wasn't a crank because Halligan, everybody else had said it was beyond saving. And I said, it's not beyond saving. I could imagine it. You know what my job actually is? I'm going to interrupt myself. When people say, what do you do? I say, I kiss frogs. <laughs> you know what I mean, don't you? Yeah. I, I love mending things, putting things into good heart. And the idea that I can go into a derelict area and derelict buildings and I can just imagine it all coming back to life. Mm. I have like a Disney, a Disney imagination in my head. And d don't you? I, I'm, are you like that too? You yeah, just look yeah. at it, you go, wouldn't that be great? You know, wouldn't that look marvellous? So, um, yeah, Heligan, people believed me because I'd done Heligan. They knew that also, the other thing is that uh, Cornwall, as you probably know, has got many, many magnificent gardens because it is, um, I don't know whether you've been, but um, the whole coastline has got these deep valleys cut in it. Um, and the Gulf Stream sort of comes across the bottom of Cornwall. And so in the valleys, you don't get the cold air. So you get you get subtropical gardens. So magnificent subtropical gardens uh, in Cornwall. So when I said we wanted to build the eighth wonder of the world with the widest range of plants and the biggest collection of economic plants in the world, yeah. it was a claim I could back up. Um, in order to make the banks think that we were sensible, we thought, 
what would even the most boring banker in the world think? What would just imagine you're a man of no I'm saying man because women have got a lot more imagination. So just imagine. <laughs> just imagine. Daniel, stop agreeing so easily. No, um, <laughs> no. Um, what would the most risk averse finance person in the world say? And you know what we thought they'd say? I don't believe you will attract more than the most visited site today in Cornwall. Regardless of whether it's world famous, we won't believe you. So that's what we did. We wrote a business plan and we realized that for a bank to lend us money, we had to say that we would only get 500,000 visitors. That ceiling told us how much money we could afford to borrow, which happened to be 23 million pounds in case you're interested. And the whole project cost 144 million. So we had to find, well, 121 million from other places. But that's how you do it. Was it difficult to get the, the rest of the money to start to fund the project? Well, when you've lived 20 years away from it, it was, of course, really easy. At the time, it was tremendously difficult. It was a bit like starting a country dance. Uh, what, what, you know, when you, you look across a line, when you do line dancing, you look to see who's going to start first, you know. And it was like that. People were saying, I'll put money in if they do. And then, so how do you get the first person to put it in? Yeah. <laughs> it's a really weird question. So what you have to do is to fib. You have to say they've put their money in. And then so someone puts it in and then you say, well, look, they've put it in and then everybody puts it in. So eventually we raised it. Um, and we were very lucky because when we were building Eden, before we finished it, we opened it up for six months um, for an exhibition called The Big Build. Actually, it was five months. And so the public came and had to wear hard hats and high visibility jackets and they could drink tea out of tin mugs and have a bacon sandwich. Mm -hmm. And we had more than half a million people came to see people building Eden without even going into it. Wow. So we knew it was going to be successful and a lot of finance people suddenly could see this was gonna be huge. Mm -hmm. And what's lovely is although we had an enormous amount of people in the first year, we had 1.8 million in our first year. But now 20 years on, we've steadied and we've got about 1.8 zero five million a year coming to a place in the middle of nowhere wow yeah. very impressive <laughs> you're listening to a little bit of genius on this episode our students are chatting with sir tim smith founder of the eden project and a world-renowned environmentalist make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode um so i just have a quick question about the garden and the structure obviously there's multiple domes what are the materials that the domes are made out of? It, it's made out of what's called ETFE, ethyl tetrafluoroethylene. To you and me, it's cling film with attitude. <laughs> it's, it's triple glazed. It's unbelievably strong. And the three layers are kept apart with compressed air between them. Uh, they allow a huge percentage of natural light to go through. So you can actually get sunburn inside oh, because yeah. it doesn't cut out ultraviolet. I think it's got about 91% light penetration. Uh, ordinary plate glass, the sort of thick plate glass that it replaced, would allow something like 65% through. So it's incredibly efficient. And the best statistic is, because it's now so light, the weight of the superstructure, everything above the foundations of the Eden Project, uh, but, but domes, is almost the same as the weight of the air contained inside it. Wow. That's pretty cool, huh? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's great. And the other cool thing is, although with energy, we've had to um, use gas because of needing to protect the plants in case there was a catastrophic uh, fall in temperature. Um, literally in this next week, we're starting to drill um, on our land towards the center of the earth. And we're going to go down 4.6 kilometers. Wow. And we're going to push water down there and it will hit the hot granite rocks and come up another tube superheated at 180 to 240 degrees. And we're going to get all of the heat that we need for the whole of the Eden project from under the un, from the from the underworld. <laughs> so we won't need gas. Isn't that cool? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it seems yeah. that you're always pretty ahead of the time. I'm not really sure anybody else has ever tried to dig underground to get their energy for whatever, actually. And also your idea with the the structures was pretty impressive. Now, that's very kind. I'd, I'd love to lay claim. Of course, it was me. 
I'm a genius. No, but the truth is, going to the middle of the ground is research that, well, since the days of, you know, journey to the centre of the world, you know, um, people have talked about it. And we've always known that the centre of the world was hot. Um, and if you travel, uh, if you're lucky enough to be able to travel to Iceland, for example, you see volcanic um, water coming up and it's boiling on the surface. And same in various other places like, uh, well, you know, Yellowstone Park in um, America and um, in North Island in New Zealand. Um, the reason we're doing it is that I'm a big fan, as I'm sure you are, of renewable energy. Yeah. And one of the arguments uh, against it has always been that um, the wind doesn't blow all the time and the sun doesn't shine all the time. And our battery technology isn't good enough to be able to store the energy to tide us over when uh, the first two things were happening. The thing about geothermal is that it, it's a bit like the holy grail of energy because it enables you to create a pallet with wind and solar to whenever either of those two aren't working you just turn open your your valve to the middle of the world and that gives you the energy you need you know when we look at my generation and compare it to yours what on earth were we doing why <laughs> why were we so lazy that we allowed people to make all the arguments about why renewable wasn't a good idea so that we burnt lots and lots of fossil fuels and we knew we were just lazy. And I remember as recently as 10 years ago, people were saying, oh, you, we, you'll only be able to do X amount with renewable energy. And now we've got a government in Britain saying that by 2030, they want all our energy to be completely renewable. Going back to when you said about building Eden, what I'm really hoping and the reason I'm doing this podcast with you is I hope your generation is a lot cleverer and dreams bigger than my generation. They're really rubbish, really rubbish. Our generation has got a lot to answer for, for being, I don't know, frightened of its own shadow and not believing that the future remains ours to make. And I hope that you have emblazoned over your school the sentence, the future still remains ours to make, you know, because it does. It really does. There is nothing that we have done that with cleverness, with humility, we can't put right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you've probably heard this question quite a bit from other people. But how has COVID-19 affected the Eden Project? COVID-19 has affected us in a number of ways. The bad ways are that we had to close. We were closed for nearly five months. And because our revenue depends on visitors coming, we had to very quickly make a lot of our colleagues redundant. So we, we lost 169 people out of Ooh. about 400. The good thing is that we opened in July and allowing for social distancing measures, we have been absolutely packed ever since. And in September, we were busier than at any time since 2002. Extraordinary. So that's good. But the most important thing about COVID is if we take as grant for granted that it's very sad how many people have died and been very ill. So we'll park that. That's very sad. The good thing is how in such a short period of time almost everybody living in the world knows we're connected to each other in a way that would not have been possible had we not had this plague and you know who else is really happy about covid i mean they are ecstatically happy they're so excited they're throwing parties as we speak pangolins pangolins do you know what a pangolin is no i have never heard of that before my dear fellow, I think you should take Nord Anglia to task for a failure in your education. A, pang <laughs> a pangolin is the scaly anteater. And now a law has been passed that you may no longer import or kill pangolins. And this has come just at a point before they were going to go extinct. Oh, so this what? is very, very good news. And I insist that after this show, this evening, you have a cup of cocoa to celebrate with the pangolins that they may have a chance of surviving because of COVID. Um, finally, uh, uh, just for the last few minutes of the podcast, what do you think will happen going forward as far as the Eden Project is concerned and just as far as uh, the world and the environment is concerned with our generation and just the generations before and after us? What do you think we can do and what do you think will happen? What I think will happen is that middle-aged men are always wrong about almost everything and should be ignored. <laughs> what, what is actually going to happen? Within three years, there will be no factories making fossil fuel engines. I believe that within five years, 
Most people will stop owning their own cars. They will be sharing cars and most of the world's vehicles will be electric. I believe that the race to a solar century will go absolutely bonkers over the next three years. And that before you know it, we will be wondering what madness had actually been consuming us for the 50 to 100 years before that with our obsession about oil. You will see a huge proportion of the world decide they don't want to eat as much meat as they were doing before. So you will see the collapse of the big agricultural industries that are based on uh, livestock, and people will continue to eat meat, but it will be meat that actually uh, the consumers believe has been treated well and has not been in an industrial situation. I think that is very good. I think you will see the three fastest growing companies in the world will be what are called clean meat companies, companies that are making artificial meat out of a whole range of vegetable products. I believe that we will actually create filters which will stop the madness of us putting over 80,000 chemicals and plastic molecules into the ocean so that the ocean has a chance to heal itself because the growth of phytoplankton and zooplankton is exponential. So if you can get them healthy, they'll be absorbing all that carbon and a revolution in agriculture and in ocean culture will mean that we will absorb that excess carbon which is taking us, us towards climate change and we will develop with a world culture where we actually realize we have to be concerned for the environment because, get this, we are happy in the environment. Humans are creatures and it makes us happy to see beautiful skies, beautiful oceans and beautiful forests. And I think it is a time the world wakes up. And I think you are going to live through the moment that this giant Rip Van Winkle wakes up. Thank you for joining us today. You seem to have a great knowledge of how the world works and you have a good idea of where it's heading. Well, Daniel and Alva, well done, and thank you very much for your very thank good interview. For everyone listening, if you want to find out a bit more about this podcast, head over to the North Anglia Education website. Catch you again next time on A Little Bit of Genius. Thank you so much for listening. Goodbye. Bye-bye.